Welcome to Practical Talk Time. I'm your host, Sandy Robel, and we have a guest who's appeared with us many times. Her name is Elaine Kuzmeskis, and this is her book. She's written her seventh book, just came out in May, and the title of it is The Medium Who Baffled Houdini, and the medium was named Marjorie Crandon, and it's actually um, true facts which Elaine has done a lot of research on. So welcome again, nice coming back. Sandy. We're so glad to have you back Thank on the you. show. Good to see you again. Yes. And um, can you tell us a little bit about your background as a medium and as an author? Well, I'm a professional medium. I was certified by the National Association of Spiritualist Churches. And I've been doing mediumship for over 40 years. I started in my early 20s and just kept going. Now, I think in the past you had even said that you were kind of born a medium. You thought everybody could see things the way that you do. Right. I was very blessed, although at the time I didn't think so, with the gift of clairvoyance. And even as a three- and four-year-old in my crib, I would see spirits, and they talked to me. I had my Hindu guy came in with a white turban and bare-chested and would often tell me what was going to happen that day. And, you know, he even said, you know, try seeing the future. And he told me to put my fingers together like this and to focus on my third eye, and I could see the future. I wasn't even in school yet. So it was quite interesting, and I was very psychic until I was about uh, 12 or 13. Then I felt kind of strange. So I wasn't so interested in talking to my guides. Mm -hmm. So you would tell parents when your children tell you something, perhaps it's not just their imagination. They Absolutely. really are. Mm -hmm. um, what prompted you to write this particular book, The Medium Who Baffled Houdini? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. In 1997, I was selected to do the uh, official Houdini seance, which is held every year. And I was invited to be the medium and to conduct the seance. And at first I thought, I don't know if I really want to do that. Because Houdini's been gone over 70 years. Is he going to come back? And then I, I thought about it for about a week and I was ready to call the Goodspeed Opera House in Haddam, Connecticut. Tell them I'll be glad to get another medium, but it's not for me. And I was combing my hair, getting ready for lunch. And who appeared in the mirror but Reverend Arthur Ford. And he had a message for me. And he said, Houdini has a message for you. And I felt that was Arthur Ford's spirit telling me to go ahead and do the Houdini seance. Now, it was very interesting because Reverend Arthur Ford, who was a great friend of my mediumship teachers, Reverend Gladys and Reverend Kenneth Custance, did the very first Houdini seance. So I felt that was a good omen. And I called back and said, yes, I would and I would like to have another medium assist because it's very important to have lots of psychic energy on stage. So Barbara Dryden Massey, who used to work in Hartford and now she lives in Lilydale, New York, was our assistant medium. And it was kind of funny. When I talked to her on the phone, we coordinated her wardrobe and I said, I'm either gonna wear black, white, or blue. And she said, okay, I'll, I'll wear one of those colors. And I got to the lobby of the Goodspeed, and it's got this beautiful double staircase. It's absolutely gorgeous if you have a chance to go to a show there. And I thought, well, I forgot to ask her what she looked like. So I said, I'm just going to look at everyone's aura, and when I find a very wide aura, I bet that'll be Barbara. Uh -huh. So she said she was a blonde, so I was looking at, there were about 50 people, and this red-headed woman had a huge aura. So I went over to her, and I said, you must be Barbara. She goes, yes, I am. And uh, she had changed the color of her hair, but her aura was terrific. You could always tell a medium they have beautiful auras, a oh. true medium. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another time we'll have to have you on talking about what auras are. And, yes. Uh, because we'd like to get as much information about this book. We talked about it a little bit at lunch before yes, the show. Yes, And who was Marjorie the uh, medium? How did she develop as a medium? And she's the one that baffled Houdini? That's correct. Now, I should ask, uh, Sandy, have you ever heard of Marjorie Grandin? No, I haven't. Houdini, and, of course, I have, the right. famous magician. Right. Well, in the 1920s, 1924, Marjorie Crandon was just about as famous as Houdini. She made headlines nationally throughout the country, and everyone was interested in her. She was a natural medium. She developed just very naturally. Harvard University tested her twice. The American Society for Psychical Research conducted a great deal of research over a period of several years and 
they did two volumes with over 500 pages on her research where they, they did show she could move objects, she could do transmediumship, and bring information through in different languages in trance. Sometimes she would write in ancient Chinese. So she was very talented. Uh, but, but she kind of petered out, whereas Houdini's name has stayed in the news. So that's why I wrote the book, so people could know what a wonderful mm -hmm. medium she was. Uh, she did baffle Houdini. In 1924, Scientific American had a contest. And in the 20s, mediumship was very popular. A lot of mm -hmm. people had lost loved ones during World War I, and they were seeing mediums. Mm -hmm. And Marjorie Crandon, husband, who was a doctor, was interested in psychic phenomena. He read a book that was popular in the early 1920s by a man by the name of Crawford, and Dr. Crawford was from Belfast, Ireland. He was an engineer, and he uh, did research on a medium by the name of Go Lighter. And what he did is he found that she really could move objects and could produce phenomena. So Dr. Crandon, being the Harvard a professor said, well, we will try this in Boston. And at 10 Lime Street, his elegant townhouse in Beacon Hill, he invited two other couples for a social evening. They went to the fourth floor where we had a library, very private library, and they got a table. He had a table made exactly as uh, William Crawford had advised, a wooden table circular with no nails. The carpenter did it exactly to uh, Dr. Crandon's specifications, and the six people put their hands lightly on the table. Not too unlike this. This is a picture of table tipping that is from one of my earlier books, The Art of Mediumship. Mm -hmm. And by the way, my website is www, The Art of Mediumship. But you can see everybody lightly places their hands on the table. Well, Dr. Crandon was a scientist. So he decided, we're going to see who the real medium is. Mm -hmm. So one by one, a person left the room, and the table kept tipping until his wife, Marjorie Crandon, left the room, and it stopped. So he said, whoa, Marjorie is the medium. And it wasn't long before she progressed from table tipping to levitation of the table. And then her husband was very excited. He was more interested in parapsychology than she was. He said, we're going to try trans. And Marjorie said, no, I am not going into trance. I will, won't be able to have any fun. I'll miss all the fun. But in those days, the husbands were very dominant. And he said, oh, yes, you're going to try it. And she <laughs> did. Uh, and she was a wonderful trance medium when she went into full trance. Remember, full trance is like being dead asleep. The old-time spiritualists used to test the trance mediums. You know how they tested them? No, I don't. They took one of those hat pins, stuck it through their hand, and if they didn't flinch, they were in trance. So you had to really be a trance medium in the old days, and Marjorie was a true trance medium. Uh, and her brother, I should show you some of the pictures now. I think they would be very interesting. This is a picture of Marjorie uh, over here, and this is a picture of her brother who died in 1911. And in 1924, he came through Marjorie and spoke to the, uh, to the group. And Walter was quite a card. He was a young man when he died, and he was a young man in spirit, and he had a very salty vocabulary. Uh -oh. He also was very ambitious, mm -hmm. and he liked to play games. And sometimes he would have uh, people bring wooden letters and put them on the floor. And there was a professor from Northampton, Dr. Ralph Harlow, who was in the seance room, and he brought a number of wooden letters, and lights were turned off. And while wow, well, the spirit of Walter moved the letters around to spell A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, which was the name of Dr. Uh, Harlow's sister who had died recently, Anna. Mm -hmm. So he liked to play games. He so this would have been something like baby blocks that babies played with? Yeah, wooden blocks, mm -hmm. and he would, he would arrange them, and he would spell okay. names of spirits. He also liked to move things. He liked to move tables. He liked to move a trumpet around the room so he could use a megaphone and talk to everyone. And he even liked to uh, produce fingerprints in wax. He had them bring a pot of wax, like paraffin wax, and a pot of cold water. And while Marjorie was in trance, the spirits would come through and put their print on the wax. 
and then afterwards they put in the cold water and there were several fingerprints that did match Walter's when he was alive. What they did is they took one of his prints from a razor that he used and they mm -hmm. showed it was genuine. It was just an interesting time. They were up for everything and Marjorie was always willing to be tested. She was a very good sport. And uh, just to give you an idea how she became famous, a man by the name of Malcolm Byrd, J. Malcolm Byrd, who was an editor for Scientific America, went to one of her seances. And he was so impressed, he wrote a 400-page book called Marjorie the Medium. Now, Marjorie did not want any publicity. Her 400 book, pages? It was a big book, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it's still in print, I believe, in England. And her real name was Minna Crandon, and she did not want any publicity because her husband was a very prominent Harvard professor and also a doctor. So they came up with the name Marjorie the Medium, and it was all hush-hush. So throughout the book, her husband is called F.H., friend husband, uh -huh. And Minna Cranston, his wife, is called Marjorie. Well, you know, the Boston uh, reporters are very sharp. I grew up in Boston, and they don't miss a trick. It wasn't long before they followed Editor Byrd, and they found out that Marjorie the Minium was actually Mrs. Leroy Crandon. Now, uh, Houdini got a copy of the book, and he, wa he did not like mediums. So he wrote on his copy, the author of this book is a liar. So oh. you could see right away he was pretty prejudiced against mediums. Uh -huh. um, now these are some pictures of Marjorie in trance. You can see when she is in trance, ectoplasm extrudes or comes out of her nose and orifices. And that ectoplasm can be used to move a trumpet. This is one of the research pictures that were taken. Mm -hmm. You can see that trumpet in this picture is right up in the air. And she also, while in trance, she's dead asleep. She's not moving anything. There was a spirit hand came and grabbed the table and moved it around the room. Now, when we spoke at lunchtime, you talked about the ectoplasm is actually connected to the medium. It is. I always was under the impression that it formed, but it was individually outside by itself. Well, actually, it forms from every orifice and also from the sitters, and it has what's called a, a cord. Now, if you break that cord, you could actually kill a medium. It's that dangerous. So always when we have, I've been to many physical seances, uh, the medium has two people, one on her right and one on her left, because no one can touch a medium when she's in trance, because it is very dangerous. They had a Professor Wood from Baltimore, from John Hopkins, that went to one of the seances, and he really was a cad, because everyone explained the rules for the seance. You are not to touch the medium, not to handle the ectoplasm unless you're told you can't. And he decided that Marjorie was a fake. So he went out in the middle of the seance and he grabbed the ectoplasm and squeezed it. And Marjorie had to stop the seance and became physically ill. And they, they decided that was enough scientific experiment for that evening. Mm -hmm. So she was really very good natured. She was always willing to try new things. And since she was a trans medium, it was really her guides that manipulated the energy. Quite mm -hmm. interesting. Um, now, let me turn this over, if I may, and we'll see what's on the other side. And why was Houdini so skeptical about her? Uh, he was skeptical of all mediums, not just Marjorie. Did he read the book before he put down that she was a liar, or did um, he just put, decide she's a liar? Well, he had an experience with Dr. Um, Conan Doyle who was a medical doctor and also the author of the Sherlock Holmes series. Uh -huh. Well, he, he was an ardent spiritualist and his wife was a medium. So when Houdini's mother died, he was very devoted to her. In fact, he came home immediately because she died while he was in Europe. Mm -hmm. And he felt guilt, felt a lot of guilt. Yeah. Um, so when uh, Mrs. Conan Doyle said she could bring the mother through, he said, okay. And she went into trance, and she always put a cross at the top of the paper because she was a Christian. And when she was in trance, she brought a message through Houdini's mother, and she talked to him as uh, Harry. Well, Houdini was not impressed because his mother never called him Harry. Mm -hmm. She called him Eric, which was his German name. And she certainly would never do a cross because she was Jewish. So he felt that was fake, and he was very dis uh, disinterested in mediumship. Mm -hmm. I can understand why. Yeah, you can see why. Yeah. Uh, and he actually investigated in the 1920s 
many mediums who do physical mediumship. And I have to say, physical mediumship is the most easy to fake. Mm -hmm. You can do, you can move trumpets with wires, you can move tables with, with tricks and things. Mm -hmm. You can have trap doors in a room and spirits coming out. So there were a lot of fake mediums. So that doesn't mean there weren't real mediums, but he was highly skeptical. Mm -hmm. So in 1924, Scientific America, which was like popular uh, mechanics today, decided to have a contest. And they wanted to see if anybody could prove there was life after death and produce physical phenomena. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of mediums applied, but the only one that made the, the cut was Marjorie Crandon. Uh, and she was such a superb medium, they decided to test her. And at the time, the prize was $2,500, which they then doubled to 5000 And Marjorie said, no, no, I, I'm glad to do the test for science, but I won't accept any money, because she was privately wealthy. Uh, and these are the men on the committee. I think it's very interesting. You see, in the upper right-hand column, we have a Connecticut gentleman, a Yale graduate, who lived in Boston by the name of Walter... Franklin Prince, and Dr. Prince was a minister. So we had somebody from the clergy tester. Uh -huh. Then on the uh, left-hand corner, we have a very uh, proper British gentleman, Professor William McDougall of Harvard University, who was a professor of psychology, and he also was uh, president at one time of the American Society for Psychical Research. So not mm -hmm. only was he knowledgeable about psychology, but about parapsychology. Mm -hmm. And then below Dr. Prince, we have an MIT professor, Dr. Daniel Frost Comstock. And Dr. Comstock was a physicist, so he had somebody from the real world of physics to test her. And, and top-notch universities. And yes, and he, yeah. uh, he developed a lot of technicolor techniques that are used in Hollywood still today. And then there's a gentleman uh, below uh, Dr. McDougall by the name of Harold Carrington. And he is one of the best known researchers in parapsychology. He had written several books on parapsychology research. Mm -hmm. So we had top-notch people testing her, a physicist, a minister, a psychologist, and a parapsychology researcher. Well, when Harry Houdini heard there was a medium going to be tested to prove life after death, he was furious. He said, this is pure nonsense, boulder dash. Yeah. And he immediately wrote the committee and asked to be on the committee. Oh. He said, I would like to investigate as well. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of insulted that he hadn't been ca called in. In fact, uh, uh, Malcolm Byrd, who was the editor, had to write a very conciliatory e a letter to Houdini saying, of course, we were waiting till a, a while to make sure our research was valid before we called on you, yeah. even though he had never planned on it. <laughs> They tried to make nice. So he agreed to be on the committee. And in this picture here, you can see uh, on the far right, we have um, O.D. Mum, who was the owner and of Scientific America. The taller gentleman is his senior editor, uh, Mal J. Malcolm Bird. There's Marjorie, looking very much the flapper that she was. Uh -huh. And we have a rather glum-looking Harry Houdini. It's unusual not to see the him The one smiling. on the far left. Yes. So okay. Houdini decided, yes, he would uh, definitely be willing to do it. And he devised a rather unusual cabinet. He said that if he was going to be uh, a researcher, he would have his own cabinet. Now, he came up with this incredible box. He called it a Margie box made out of wood. This is from the Library of Congress. Is that still in exi existence? It might be in the Smithsonian or someplace, but it, the picture uh -huh. is from the Library of Congress. Uh -huh. And you can see how cumbersome that would be for anybody, never mind if somebody was trying to produce physical phenomena. Uh, and so the book talks about that particular experiment, as well as the aftermath, because afterwards he did quite a bit of damage to not only Marjorie the medium, but mediums all through the 1920s. He died in 1926, but... Between 1924 and 26, he was on a rampage. So did he disprove media. her? He, 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 uh, you have to read the book. There's a lot of interesting details in it. You may have to make up your own mind. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> he, 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 cho he chose his point of view, and uh, the scientific community had their point of view. Scientific America didn't know what to do at this point, so she didn't get the prize, which she wouldn't have claimed anyway. And... The Boston Society for Psychical Research was so evenly divided as to whether Marjorie was a real medium or a fake, 
they actually disbanded. Big, big controversy. So I wrote the book to give different viewpoints and let the reader make up their own mind. Uh -huh. So you're, yeah. not, you're not saying? Well, it's as many points of view. Many uh -huh. points of view. From Harvard, from Scientific America, from Harry Houdini, from Harold Carrington, uh, J. Malcolm Byrd had his point of view, so everyone had a different viewpoint on it. And of course, you spent a long time right. researching all of this. Of course, this. I personally believe she was real, but I did include everyone's research so you can make your own decision. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there is information about these people at Harvard and Yale? Or of course, the records are still there, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, what made her so popular? Oh, she had a great personality. She reminds me of Meg Ryan, the actress. Happy-go-lucky, funny, charming, uh -huh. the ultimate socialite, party go. You know, one time she went into a restaurant in Boston. I grew up in Boston, and they're very proper. They're still very proper. Yeah. And she went to one of the tea rooms on Tremont Street. She just decided she wanted to have a bite. In those days, ladies couldn't go to bars or any place you served liquor. You had to be very careful. So she went to this little tea room with other ladies were present. And she was sitting there waiting for her tea, and the table started to shake. Because she was a natural medium. Things moved around her without her doing anything. So she had to get up and leave her meal half eaten. She was always on. Speaking about the table uh, shaking, remember a few years ago, yeah. Usha, you and I were having lunch before we came, and the table was shaking? Oh, that was funny. That was a real reason, though. Well, Usha was looking at you and she wasn't she was you were talking about spirits she thought it was spirits and she's looking under the table yeah and you were looking at me I was to take I didn't feel anything I'm taking some of my pills that I needed to take I thought take. maybe you weren't feeling well your yeah, knees and were I didn't shaking know I was shaking you said my hand was shaking I didn't even notice it and then when we got here it turned out that there had been an earthquake physical phenomena you have to rule out physical causes that's very yeah. important but all three of us I, I was unaware we should thought you were talking about spirits there's spirits there you thought I thought you were you weren't feeling well your knees were shaking so I didn't know what to say I said are you okay Sandy but it actually was an earthquake tremor right right but it was funny how we each had um, a different viewpoint and we were experiencing the same thing and I was actually oblivious to it all I know uh, we have about five minutes left yes and um, how long did it take you to research for this book? Of uh, course, you're always researching, as I know. Right. Uh, well, I actually started writing the book about 2000. And I had one whole uh, part, one the book pretty much done by 2008. And then I rewrote the whole book. Wow. So it took, I just felt I, I had more information. I had studied more. More things came out. I was able to get a hold of some of the older research, so I redid a lot of the chapters, especially the chapters involving research of Harvard, Scientific America. And um, I was able to get a hold of some old Fate magazine articles where Dr. Harlow, ta Ralph Harlow, talked about uh, his seeing seances with Marjorie Crandon. Mm -hmm. And a gentleman by the name of Dr. Richardson from Springfield, his daughter, actually wrote articles. She was a teenager and she had been to some of Marjorie Crandon's seances. So I got a lot of primary research that I wanted to put in the new edition. Mm -hmm. So I rewrote I, it. I know we're also into astrology and we I never thought of this. It just came up in my mind now. Did you ever get the uh, birth charts of each of these people on the committees and so forth? That would be interesting. I don't think I could get time births. I'd probably be able to get uh, the dates. Like a noon chart or yeah. a rising? But even Houdini's chart, we're not sure. He probably was about three degrees of Aries, but we're not totally sure because they didn't keep as good of records mm -hmm. as they do now. And he was born in Europe. Uh huh. B but just be, be interesting. interesting. Yes. Well, even Marjorie's, I don't quite trust. I just thought of that now. Oh, but be yeah. fun. Yeah, be, that'd be a whole new chapter, wouldn't it? Yes, a new book for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe a chapter. Yeah. A chapter? Yeah. I don't know, but if you looked at all the charts of all those people, it would take quite yeah. a while the last, to explain. The last picture I did want to show you was that uh, after Houdini, we have had three the minutes left. Seance, okay. He did put a book out where he tried to show that Marjorie was a fake. And he claimed the trumpet moved around the room in the darkness that she actually picked it up, put it on her head, and flung it across the room. Now, don't you think the Harvard scientists and MIT professors would have been able to pick up on yes, that? Yes, and I would think it would crash on the other side. I, of the it was ridiculous. They had excellent controls. They taped her in the chair. They even marked where the tape was so she couldn't move in uh -huh. many of the seances. And in that uh, 
contraption he, he built, I don't think she can move her head anyway. Was that all included in your book, too? Yes, all these details. All the, all the yeah. things that they did. Right. But controls. I do want the reader to make their own assumption and to read it very carefully, because it's a thrilling story. It's a woman's story, but it is also a story of scientific research and a story of parapsychology. Mm -hmm. which was in its heyday in the 1920s. Right, and there were, there were several men that were involved in Absolutely. Actually, they were all uh, men involved in the research, right? She was the, only the medium was a woman. Right. Yes. Uh, but Dr. Richardson's daughter did a lot of parapsychology research afterwards, too. And what about today? Are there any um, scientific experiments going on with mediums that Absolutely. you know Absolutely. In Arizona, Dr. Gary Schwartz has done a lot of research, and the top mediums were... Um, uh, Ann Gaiman, who is a spiritualist uh, from Lily Dale, and I've seen her work, and she is an excellent medium. Mm -hmm. And uh, Suzanne Northup, who I've all seen, so seen work in, is another excellent medium. Right, and we're going to be doing another uh, show with you on uh, seances, I believe. Yes. Leadership. And uh, we can e even talk a little bit about how sometimes things get ruined. I think any profession, there can be some phonies or people that don't mm -hmm. do the right thing. And... Um, we can also tell the viewers of the next show about that as well. Yes, and it's going to be on my book on physical phenomena that I, I wrote several years ago. It's called Seance 101, and it's about physical mediumship. I went to Brazil, England, and all over the United States for this research. Mm -hmm. So I hope you'll have a wonderful chance to present it to the, your viewers. Right, and I, you've done a wonderful job outlining your book for us, but... Of course, I wanted all the answers, and now I have to read your book. Oh, I want people to think. That's the important right, thing. Right, right. And make their own decision. Yes, and we have uh, the end of the show now, and I want to thank you once thank more you so much, Sandy. for being on. It's always fun listening to mm -hmm. you and um, listening to all the work that you put into doing the research. And, of course, people would be able to do this on their own, right? They could take the names in the book and look it up. Oh, I look forward to it. If there any viewers out there have research, I please call right, and, or write um, me. You have, you have a website, too, that was on the air. And right. You can always um, email us at practicaltalktime right. at yahoo.com, and I'm sure you'd be happy to answer any of the questions. Right. So if anyone um, is watching and you have questions about this, email us at practicaltalktime at yahoo.com, and... Uh, We'll forward them to Elaine. Thank you for watching.